Let us now return to Genesis chapter 26 and let us look at this chapter in its totality. There are three things that I would like to highlight from this chapter and I trust they will be for our edification. The title is Three Lessons from Isaac. Three Lessons from Isaac. We are inclined to believe that this part is not chronological in the life of Isaac and we'll explain that somewhat later. We looked at chapter 25 last week. We noticed Isaac at home with his wife and the boys and we noticed one or two things there. But this, this chapter here, or at least the bulk of it, we do believe happened before uh, the events in chapter 25. Each generation of believers or Christians face the same temptations. We know our outward circumstances, our environment, things like that can change. We can make progress as far as technology is concerned, but basically nothing really changes from generation to generation. God tests us to bring out the best in us, but Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us. And we find that here on at least two occasions in this chapter. And that's why we say that uh, the enemy doesn't change. Satan doesn't change. And human nature hasn't changed either. And therefore, the, the life that the believer lives is consistent throughout the generations. Our outward circumstances may change, but the temptations are basically the same. And we, in this chapter here, we will notice there are at least two temptations for Isaac. And the first one we would highlight is from verses 1 to 6. And we might entitle this, The Temptation to Run. The Temptation to Run. He had a real problem. There was a famine in the land. We really don't know what that is. Some places in the world do know. And it's a real difficulty. If there's no water, ultimately there'll be no food. It's as simple as that. And there was a famine in the land. It was a similar famine to what happened in the time of Abraham, his father. And Isaac, to some extent, was just going to follow his father. He went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, and to Gerar, to escape from the famine. And it would seem that he intended to go down to Egypt. Verse 2 tells us, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Basically, stay where you are. Stay there. It might not be easy, but nevertheless, you're to stay there. Because there's always a, a temptation when difficulties come along to the believer that he may get somewhat unsettled and we can have this kind of mentality that the grass is always greener on the other side and maybe it's time to up sticks and go. It's uncomfortable where we are. Things are not working out. Well, Isaac was to find out here that the safest place in the world for the believer is in the will of God. That's the safest place. And until God reveals his will to you that you should move, you should stay exactly where you are. And that applies to whatever, whatever part of life you'd like to mention. Is it your neighborhood, for instance? Or is it your, your occupation? Or is it your congregation? Or whatever. 
You are not to move willy-nilly. You are to recognize that if you are in the will of God, then he would have you to live where you live, to work where you work, to worship where you worship. Stay there. And if God wants to move you, he will make it abundantly clear. And he made it abundantly clear to Isaac that he was to stay there. He was, to, he was in the will of God and he would be blessed and he was blessed. Blessed a hundredfold. And the, the people round about him could see that there's something about this individual. There's something about him. They couldn't articulate it. They didn't know what it was. They might say loosely, well, the Lord is with them, but they really didn't know, but they could see it was evident that there is something about that individual. He's got the blessing of the Lord. And you may well be in difficulties. You may well, well, may well be in trials and tribulations and things that are not, not pleasant for flesh and blood. And you might be thinking about well, it's time to move on. That place over there or that country or that, or that city or that town looks far better, far more appealing. And maybe providence has, has opened a door for you. But you are never ever to forget that God will never lead you to a place where his grace cannot provide for you. This is what happened to Isaac. He left because of a famine. He had to feed his, himself and his wife. He had to look after them. He went as far as Gihar. That was far enough. Don't go to Egypt. You will be looked after. You will be provided. Everything will be well for you. Why? Because you are in the will of God. And you must resist this temptation to run and to run away from your trials and to run away from your, from your difficulties. Because ultimately, no matter where we might go, our ultimate problem is ourselves. And we take ourselves wherever we go. And we take our problems with us wherever we go. <coughs> and maybe you are <coughs> experiencing some kind of difficulties and the temptation is to move and to find pastures new. But if you are in a, in a bit of a strait, unbelief will say to you, fallen human nature, unbelief will say to you, how can I get out of this? But what does faith say? Faith says something different. Believing says something different. Faith asks, what can I get out of this? Do you see the difference? Do you distinguish between it? Unbelief says, how can I get out of this? This is difficult. I don't want to be here. I don't want to encounter these things. How can I get out? But, un but faith looks at the same circumstances with a different set of eyes, as it were. Faith asks, what can I get out of this? In other words, what benefit can I get out of it? If God is in my life, and I'm, in the, and I'm in the will of God, God indeed will provide for me. And even in a difficult situation, I will get something out of it that will be of benefit to my spiritual life and my spiritual well-being. He was in a famine. We didn't read it, but we read it last week in chapter 25, verse 11, it says, And it came to pass, after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi. So, when the famine came, he was in Lahiroi. And they reckon it's about 75 miles to Gihar. That's as far as he travelled. And that was enough. God said, enough, stay here, I will look after you, you're in my will, I will provide, my grace will not be taken from you. Because as we said, it does look as if he eyed Egypt, the very place where his father went, that he should not have gone to. 
And this is something that can happen. Very often, children can follow in the footsteps of their parents. And sometimes these footsteps are not great, are not good. But the Lord was there with them. And the Lord is with all his people. He has said, never will I leave thee, nor forsake thee. So the first temptation there was the temptation to move. The second temptation we have in this, in this chapter is the temptation to lie. Again, this is a copycat incident of what his father did twice. Twice in the, the history of Abraham, Abraham said to people that Sarah was his sister. But Isaac said exactly the same about Rebekah. We have it here in verse 9. Um, no, verse 7. She is my wife. Strictly speaking, Isaac's sin was worse than that of Abraham's. Why? Well, Abraham was half true because Sarah was his half-sister. That was true. But she wasn't his sister. But Isaac said, <coughs> she is my wife. Or she is my sister. She is my sister. When of course she was his wife. It came to light as usually what happens. All lies will usually come to light. And this is why we believe that chapter 25 happened after what we're reading here. Because just imagine the scenario. If there was Isaac and Rebekah, where were the two children? Where were the twins? It would be very difficult for Isaac to say, she is my sister, if there were some twins running around with them. And therefore, that's why we're inclined to say that this happened before the birth of the twins. But anyway, as you know, he was spotted in verse 8, and it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Now exactly what was going on here, we cannot be certain, but the behavior between the two of them, we're not saying it's wrong in any sense, but the behavior between the two of them was not what you would expect between a brother and sister. There was some kind of romantic encounter here. Maybe he was cuddling her, we don't know. But it was obvious then to Abimelech, this is not his sister. There's something more going on here. And he questioned him and it came to light. There's always this temptation, even with believers, friends, when we are confronted with something not to tell the truth. We know it's rampant in our society. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. You will know that in Westminster or, or Holyrood, or indeed in local politics, it's very, very difficult to find truth. It's hard to find. It's fallen to the ground. But this can also happen with believers, as it did here on this occasion. And we are to make it abundantly clear that lying in whatever form, whether it might be white lies, or spin, or flattery, or innuendo, or fake news, or half-truths, or indeed remaining silent when you know the truth, when someone has been falsely accused, are all breaches of the ninth commandment. And God looks for truth. 
He looks for our yea to be yea and our no to be no. And this is what he would have throughout the whole of society. And as we see our society collapsing, as it is, one of the reasons it's collapsing because you cannot really trust anyone, particularly in public life. And where society, it cannot possibly operate as it should, where truth is not honoured. There's a very apt and appropriate verse in Proverbs, as you might expect, in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Truth will last. Truth will be maintained. Truth is eternal. It cannot change. It never will. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. And that is what Isaac found here. He had been there a long time. We're told in verse 8, a long time. But his lie was exposed. And that is the way it will be. And a believer might think that he's got away with a lie and nothing has happened. But even after a long time, the truth will come out. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. And therefore it is incumbent upon us that in our interactions with one another, in the courts of the church, in our homes and in our families, in our communities, in our workplaces, indeed where we interact with any person, we are to be trustworthy, we are to be truthful, we are to be known as persons whose word is true. They might not like your profession, they might not like your Bible, they might not like the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they might disdain you because you take your Bible and you go to the house of God and you live a life as a Christian. They might not like it, but they will notice when someone is telling the truth. Colossians, another verse that's apt and appropriate here for us. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And here's a very apt addition to that, what I've just quoted, which is very apt and appropriate for what we're looking at. That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. How could Isaac answer Abimelech? Oh, she is my sister, he said. And he maintained that, that lie for some considerable amount of time. And then Abimelech exposes it. How could Isaac speak to that person again when this unbeliever, this idolater, this pagan exposed that Isaac was a liar. How could he look him in the face again? That's what it says, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. However rosy it might look to utter a lie, be sure it will be exposed. And it will be exposed to your shame. God will see to it. The lying tongue is but for a moment. And therefore let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And as First Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says to us, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Wonderful sound counsel from the Word of God to conduct our everyday uh, behavior. And the tongue is something we use every day. And we are to be careful what we say. Sometimes it would be far better if we said nothing. 
Some of us are too inclined to be speaking all the time. A dangerous position to be in. But whenever we speak, let it be with truth. And let it be with love. Well, thirdly and finally, another lesson we want to learn from uh, this chapter. And it's not so much a temptation, but it could have been a temptation. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the fact that when he needed water, he was moving around. What did he do? He dug or he opened up his father's wells. We notice that from verses 12 to 35, a large part of this chapter is taken up with this, how that he was successful, therefore they told him to move on. You're too successful. We, the land cannot look after us together. Move on. Go somewhere else. So he goes somewhere else. And what happens? He has to find water. Water is a very, very uh, scarce commodity in the Middle East. And it was vital for him, as it indeed is vital for all of us. What was he going to do? He might, he might be tempted. Well, here's the wells that my father Abraham dug or his servants dug for him, but they're all full of rubbish. They've been blocked up by the Philistines. I can only assume because they wanted the water for themselves and it would be easy for them then to block it up and maybe the water would appear somewhere else. I don't know, but they blocked up the wells that Abraham's servants had dug. And maybe Isaac might say, well, I'll go and look for more wells. Find some fresh wells. I'm not going to dig these wells again and take all that rubbish out. Instead, I'll find someone else. But no. Isaac was wise. Isaac said to himself, well, there's water here. All we've got to do is move the rubbish out of here and we'll get water. And that's what he did. And because of it, he was harassed. The people, the Abimelech's servants, they came and they said, move on, it's our water, move on. And Isaac had to do exactly the same again. He would move on to a new place and he would dig up the wells that his father had that were blocked. And he would find water. And so it went on. Well, there's at least two things we would notice here. And maybe if you remember what we said or some of what we said last week, we said last week words to this effect that Isaac was a quiet individual and he was a, a person who didn't want to confront his enemies. He would rather, when facing a confrontation, he would rather back, back off and move away. Now there's a place for that. There's a place for that on occasions. And we're not going to criticize and we're just simply going to observe this is what he did. The confrontation was there. He was a quiet chap, a chap that liked to meditate in the field at nights. He wanted the quiet life. He didn't want any confrontation, so he walked away. Other times it's not the case. Other times you have to confront these kind of situations. One has to be wise. But the main lesson that we're meant to learn from this section in the chapter is that Isaac took the view there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel. There's water there. The wells have been dug. They've just been blocked. A bit of labor, a bit of work. We'll get to the water and we will be able to feed ourselves and our flocks. After all, Abraham was there. He was a wealthy individual. He had lots of flocks and he thrived. And therefore, that's the, pro that's the solution to the problem. Get to where the water was before because it will still be there. There's a lesson for the church. A lesson for this congregation. A lesson for the professing Christian church. What is the lesson? Well, the lesson is that Abraham knew the blessing because he went to the water. And he, 
And if Isaac was going to get the blessing, he had to get rid of the rubbish and get the water. The lesson for the church is we are to get back to basics. Get back to living the Christian life. Get back to preaching the Christian gospel. Get back to worship as it should be. Get back to calling out to God in prayer, recognizing that these are the means of grace that God has given to his church in order that they might prosper, in order that they might flourish. What are, if we like, our spiritual weapons? What are they? What has God given to the church in order for the church to flourish in an ungodly world? And every generation is an ungodly world. Well, the weapons that he has given to the church are the preaching of the gospel. And we are to have confidence in the preaching of the gospel. We preach Christ and him crucified. That's what we are to preach. And we know it's foolishness to some, but nevertheless, it is the power of God unto salvation. We are to gather together to worship like we're doing here. We are to worship God the way that he has laid down and prescribed in the word of God. We are not to deviate. We are not to introduce things into the worship that we don't find in the word of God. That's the rubbish that the Philistines have thrown into the water. That's the rubbish of the world that is thrown into the Christian church today. We are to get rid of that rubbish. And we are to rely upon the means that God has given to his church. We are to come before God in prayer. We are to open up our hearts to God in prayer that he might bless us. And that he would send the Holy Spirit. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Is this not what we're needing? Is this not what is um, absent in our Christian congregations, in the Christian church today? We don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. We are to know fellowship. We are to know real love between believers. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. We are to be separate from the world. We are not to be like the world. Yes, we are to be in the world and we are to live our life in that world. We are not to go out into monasteries or nunneries. We are not to be separate in that sense. We are to be active in this world and we are to bring our Christianity with us wherever we go and still being separate from the world. These are the things that we rely upon. That's what it is. And the Philistines came along and they threw all their rubbish into the wells. And we've got to take the rubbish out. The rubbish that the world has put into the church. Now I'm not against social action. It has its place. But do not think for one moment that uh, a coffee morning or a lunch club is for the church. We're not to be waiting upon tables. This is not what the church is all about. We have a mission, and the mission is to preach the gospel and to lay bare the claims of Jesus Christ to all our hearers, beseeching them, urging them to come and to avail themselves of the, the glorious salvation that he has single-handedly secured by his life and death and resurrection. This is what we are to put our faith and hope and trust in, in what Christ has given to his church. And let us clear out any obstacles 
and get to the life-giving water, the Holy Spirit himself, who will come upon us and change us and change the church. And when the church is changed, then what will happen? Well, society, it will be changed. And society is what it is because the church has become what it should not be. And we have to be like Isaac, get back to these old wells, get back to the pure water, get back to relying upon God. Because ultimately, as someone did pray tonight, it is his cause, it's his work. And yes, we can be concerned about it, about the cause, and we should be concerned about the cause, but in one real way. And I don't want anyone to misunderstand me. God is more concerned about his cause than all of us put together. And when I say he is concerned, I don't mean to say he is anxious or he is worried, but he is intimately concerned about his cause, and he will defend it. We are not, therefore, to despair, but we are to play our part. Clear out the rubbish. Get to the water. Therefore, the blessing will follow. Three, then, lessons from Isaac. Let us avoid that temptation to move. Let us avoid that temptation to, to lie, to make things look easy. And let us avoid that temptation of tampering with what God has given to his church and instead get back to biblical basics. May the Lord bless his word to us. Let us pray together.